Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today from Gettysburg College is Jill Ogline Titus. She is the Associate Director of the Gettysburg Institute and the author of a cool book called Gettysburg 1863. 1963. See, I knew I'd end up in the wrong It's you every century. time, doesn't it? <laughs> Jill, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We had a joke when uh, Pete Carmichael and I had a joke when I was working on this book that I was going to title it, you know, Gettysburg 1963, and then I was going to put it in the most confusing font possible. So everybody would think it was a book about the battle and I would get all these people who would buy it who otherwise probably wouldn't. <laughs> well, and that probably speaks to kind of the point where I wanted to start, where like Gettysburg is a town that most of us think we know, um, either from 1863 or from our visits, you know, in the contemporary world. But here you've given us um, what I think is really the great joy of the book is a chance to see something we think we know in a way we don't know um, by catching this snapshot. Tell me about Gettysburg in 1863 or 1963. Look at that snapshot. <laughs> So Gettysburg in 1963 definitely is, you know, recognizable to those of us who know it today, but it also has, it, you know, a, a slightly different pop population composition. It looks a little bit different. Physically, the landscape is, is, is somewhat distinct. You know, it's a community in, 19, in, in the 1960s, community about 8,000 people who have a very unique relationship to the landscape, to the history. A lot of the residents at that time were direct descendants of the wartime generation. The African-American population in Gettysburg at that time was a little bit larger proportionally than it is today. They made up about 3% of the borough population. And it was a time in which automobile trans, you know, transportation and a new kind of tourism had, had really dramatically affected the, the landscape and raised uh, a, a whole new host of preservation concerns. You know, this was the time that commercial development around Gettysburg to cater to these automobile-based tourists who were increasingly families and families with young children, people moving in a nuclear family unit in a way that previous generations of tourists largely had not. Um, it is a time where the community was wrestling with what is the line between commemoration and preservation and economic vitality. How do we preserve what people come here for? And at the same time, you know, make a living for ourselves, for those of us who live here. And think about what this battlefield should look like, what it should be, what it, what this landscape for the future, for the next, you know, hundred years of Civil War commemoration needs to look like. What would the visitors of tomorrow need? And, you know, we, we sort of think about Gettysburg turning into Gettysburg because, uh, as folks well know, it's close to the population centers. It's a place where a lot of veterans can first come and walk the ground. And you know, and that's a much different uh, dynamic of visitation than, you know, the Lincoln Highway bringing carloads of families into town all of a right. sudden. Um, was that a what kind of tension did that create for people who live there? Well, you know, Gettysburg at that time was, well, Adams County as a whole was, was considered a place of, I forget the, the specific federal designation, but it was, it, it, it was a place where a significant percentage of the population was underemployed, for, for, for lack of a better word. You know, the community as a whole, the county as a whole, agriculture was still the, the primary employer at, at this time. And outside of the borough of Gettysburg, you know, the labor force, there, there, were, there was a significant migrant labor force in this community, something that I think most people don't think about in their perceptions of, of Gettysburg. For um, many residents of the, the, the borough and the surrounding areas, aside from agriculture, tourism was the primary employer. There was a lot of concern about the tax base. Um, the, the population was growing. There was a lot of concern that the tax base was not keeping pace with the rapidly growing population and would not be substantial enough to you know, provide for the employment needs of, of, of many people in the community. So as parcels of land 
that had previously been undeveloped began to be identified as you know, sites for housing developments or sites um, in, in 1959, 1960, there was a big outcry about the, the county wanted to sell off a, a parcel of land that it owned on the first day's battlefield because they needed to build a new home for the elderly. And they simply said, we cannot come up with the money any other way. We have to sell this part of the battlefield. The Gettysburg National Military Park's response was, all of these things in conjunction mean that the first day's battlefield is severely threatened, and our ability to understand and interpret that first day of the battle is going to be seriously compromised if we lose this land. But because there was no local zoning in Adams County at this time, the park lost out on an enormous amount of money that had been earmarked to acquire that sort of threatened land. A lot of that land went under development, the North Gettysburg Shopping Plaza that we, st we still have sort of the remnants of it today, that was built on this this this, oh, this poor farm site, it was called. There were, there, this call to save the poor farm kind of went out around the country. There were newspaper articles, magazine articles, big, a lot of outcry was, was directed at the Adams County commissioners um, for their sort of it perceived selfishness and short-sightedness in, in, in selling and developing this land. And this is where the, the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association comes into existence um, because it was, it was assumed at the time that the pace of development in Adams County, the fact that there aren't local, that local zoning isn't in place, means that publicly funded land acquisition just is not going to happen. If we're going to preserve the battlefield outside of the parts that are already owned you know, and operated by the National Park Service, it's going to have to come through private donations. And that's what the GBPA was set up to do. And they made a big deal of the centennial anniversary of the battle saying, you know, this is our time. If we don't preserve this land now, when everybody cares about Gettysburg and everybody's watching, everybody's horrified by the, the you know, the, the this emerging can commercial landscape that they are that they're increasingly seeing as they come here to our community if we don't do this now the opportunity will pass us by and we'll never have another chance and what surprised me or maybe it shouldn't have is that here we are 60 years later and many of these same still tensions exist in the community where you've got a borough that is surrounded on all sides by national park service land and how do you balance the economic needs of a community with its ability to grow its identity those are all issues that you begin to explore uh, i think fascinatingly in in the book that we can still go and see happening today that struck me as well in many in many cases as I dug into the records and and as I you know as I read the rhetoric and the responses and the arguments it sounded extraordinarily modern it sounded very similar to you know things I have heard myself and seen myself now you know you call Gettysburg the most famous small town in America um what is it that that gives it that small time charm that, that that still makes it so famous in uh, in 1963. Well, I think it was a lot of things. I mean, it was the success of the narrative of the high water mark, the idea that Gettysburg was the place where the deciding battle was fought, the the place where the Union was saved, or the place where the Confederacy came closest, depending on the interpretation that you know that somebody at that time might have brought to it. It was the place where Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address um, and at the height of the Cold War. The Gettysburg Address was increasingly perceived and used by, uh, by uh, federal officials and people involved in international diplomacy as the sort of the American creed, the foundation of American foreign policy, the the heart and soul of what it meant to be American. I think it, in the 1950s and the 1960s, those Cold War years saw more of an emphasis on the idea that the Gettysburg Address embodied what it meant to be American and embodied that vision of freedom that would be, you know, that would be the bull, the world's bulwark against communism and Gettysburg is the place where people could touch that closest you know the, the place where it came closest to home also increasingly as you know as 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 development did take place and and the idea of Gettysburg as this family vacation destination solidified it became a a, a place that families could 
take their children to you know give them a brief lesson in in cold war values a brief lesson in what it meant to be american a, a, a history lesson and at the same time they could get ice cream and they could play miniature golf and they could go to fantasy land and then they could go to washington dc afterwards or or philadelphia um so i think it, gettysburg came to mean so many things, you know, building on the meaning that had already existed for, for generations, but but shifted into some different directions in, in the 1960s. Um, there was something else I was going to say in relation to that, and now I've just lost it. It was right it was right on the tip of my tongue. And you'll remember it like 2 a.m. Like, I will. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it comes back to you, feel free to interrupt me. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, but when you talk about that Cold War context, which I want to talk about next, but, uh, you know, to me, that really made something like the Hall of Presidents make sense where, yes. you know, wh why do we have a wax museum of the presidents on a Civil War battlefield? Well, you know, this this notion of Cold War values and, you know, patriotism, and here's a great way to kind of get that across. And a lot of those, you know, what we sort of think of now as nostalgic touristy things um, were really geared toward that explicit experience. Um, tell me a little about some of your favorite stories with, with that as you explored kind of the, the, the creation of this Cold War landscape. Sure, sure. I actually remembered what I was going to say. That <laughs> it came to okay. me just as just as you were talking, and it, it it's kind of related to this. Um, one thing that I found so interesting about this was that as early as the late '50s, the National Park Service wanted to make what they called the the like the the final development of Gettysburg National Military Park, the heart and soul of the centennial right. nationwide. You know, there was at this there there was the, the the popular vision for what the centennial would look like was already taking shape, and it was the idea of you know grassroots commemoration everywhere, state commemorative committees in, in in as many states as possible, local commemorations, you know, people working at all kinds of levels, activities all across the country, and there was a group at the highest levels of the the NPS. In 1957, 1958, 1959, who were saying, you know what, I don't think that's a good idea. First of all, I think people are going to get tired of the Civil War if they're being confronted with it everywhere for five years. I mean, probably not emerging Civil War fans, but uh, other people. Uh, Secondly, there's too much room for embarrassment. People are going to do hokey things. They're going to do historically inaccurate things. There are going to be embarrassing situations. Sectional tensions are going to be inflamed. This, you know, this issue of the relationship between the racial conflicts in the 1950s and 60s and the unfinished business of the Civil War that many involved in the commemoration were trying so hard to keep out of the public eye and just sort of stamp down. That's going to rage, you know, uncontrolled. We're not going to be able to control the narrative. And their, their response to all of this was, we need to have a focused commemoration. Pick one place, commemorate one thing, and throw all of our resources and energy into fully preserving one battlefield landscape. And of course, they say the place to do that should be Gettysburg. The whole focus of the centennial should be Gettysburg. There should be a Museum of the American Civil War built at Gettysburg, we should focus on acquiring all of the threatened land, expanding the battlefield boundary, um, rededicating the National Cemetery, and making Gettysburg even more of what we think it already is, Americans' focal point of for the Civil War. So they're building on what they see as, as, as a popular assumption anyway, that, you know, that Gettysburg is the Civil War. Right. And their hope was to further crystallize that and make the preservation of Gettysburg, the lasting legacy of the centennial. And it seems to me that uh, uh, certainly some pros and cons to that. Looking backward, it seems like what a missed opportunity it would have been had we done that um, because so much else would then not have been preserved. Right. Um, now, as we know, they, they come up with a different vision for the centennial. Um, that becomes problematic in its way. And so then Gettysburg sort of turns into this opportunity to refocus what had been uh, and, and what people have called the troubled commemoration right. Um Gettysburg then gets to kind of save the day in some respects. In some ways, yes. 
and 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 Gettysburg is is in many ways operating independently. You know, Gettysburg was not a commemoration that was managed by the federal U.S. Civil War Centennial Commission. It was a, it was a commemoration that was funded and managed on a state and local level. So we have a, an entirely different group of people leading this commemoration, doing the planning, but they are watching closely what is happening, what is unfolding in 1961 and 1962. And they are drawing some clear sort of lessons from that of things that they plan to do, things that they plan not to do. Um, they, they, they're, they're trying very, very hard to return the focus to the original idea of the commemoration of the war as a vehicle for sort of popular nationalism and a vehicle for presenting a, a, a positive image of the United States on the world stage and, and playing and in, leaning into that reconciliationist history at Gettysburg to, to, you know, to soothe the tensions that had so clearly been, um, you know, raised through the centennial experience. But at the same time, at least among certain people, there is some sense of a desire largely rooted in the Gettysburg Address to use Gettysburg as it's a place to actually talk somewhat about emancipation and the legacy of the war for African Americans and the connection between civil rights struggles, both in the US and around the globe, and the American Civil War, which is not something that we saw happening in other centennial commemorations, significant, certainly not in any kind of significant way prior to Gettysburg in 1963. And, you know, and that's one of the ironies I find, uh, and, you know, and you kind of draw this out in the book where, you know, one of the arguments against making Gettysburg as the central commemoration point is that Southerners will be offended because they lost. Right. Um, and yet when the centennial kicks off in Charleston at a segregated hotel, they don't seem to be all that upset about offending African-Americans, you know, which is a huge constituency. And yeah. so, uh, you know, to use the phrase double standard might be a little harsh, but I mean, there's a lot of weird dynamics involved in all these converging forces, which your book just kind of really neatly draws these threads out. And wow, oh, wow, wow. You know, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about it. Well, thank you. That that was my hope. And I mean, I came to the book, certainly I have, I'm trained in public history. I have a background in public history. I work pretty extensively with my students on the battlefield landscape in a variety of ways, but I am fundamentally a 20th century historian. I'm a historian of the civil rights era. And, and so I came at this book from those dual perspectives, you know, public history and that 20th century interest in the connection between the Cold War and civil rights and historical commemoration. And, and, and I'm just amazed that I was in Gettysburg for working in Gettysburg for five years before it became utterly clear to me that this was a that this was a project and that I, that I, this was not only a project but a project that I was pretty well situated to to take on and super excited about and you know for folks and I, I highly encourage folks to read the book Gettysburg 1963 I'll make sure I get my uh, century correct this time um where you know that focus of small town America, yet in the middle of these huge national forces of commemoration, national tumult with the civil rights movement, and then these international forces that are going on with the Cold War, and what a what a fascinating convergence of of all these different forces in this little tiny small town. Um, I mean, I think I said somewhere in the book that the power of Gettysburg is rooted in the fact that it has these multiple identities. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a place, you know, it's a real place with real people. It's, it's a historic landscape and it's an idea. It's an idea in, in, in our national discourse and an idea that even resonates on a, on an international scale, certainly at the height of the cold war, an idea about who we are as a people and what democracy means and so because it has so many layers and so many directions it was it's a wonderful prism for understanding these forces that that drove american political culture in the mid 20th century when you articulate it that way who we are as a people and obviously that puts the 
sort of the Cold War forces at odds with the civil rights forces, because, right. you know, certainly the civil rights movement is asking, who are we? And it's demonstrating an answer that is a lot different than we want the answer to be from a Cold War perspective. Right. How did you see the clash of those two um, in opposition to each other? Yeah, yeah. So I, the, so of course, fundamentally, the, the big difference is that from the from for the for the standpoint of a lot of cold warriors, you know the the United States strength was in the idea of consensus that 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 this was a country ruled by law and customs, and that there were certain ways that change came about through democracy, through the legal system, through um, through the legislative process, and that Americans as a whole were enjoying the benefits of freedom and were working carefully to perfect their democracy through those you know quiet approved long established channels in the vision of many civil rights activists the united states was not a functioning democracy it their citizen the rights of citizenship were not Hell, we're not extended to all Americans and that the rhetoric the United States used on an international scale about protecting the rights of the marginalized and protecting you know minorities in their communities and upholding representative government that this was hypocrisy of, of you know the, the highest degree because it wasn't happening here in the United States. And to change that, certainly work through the court, certainly tried to change the laws certainly try to influence the legislative process, but also demonstrate in the streets, engage in mass direct action. Um, you know, throw yourselves at the barricades until the barricades fall. Street demonstrations were abhorrent to most U.S. government officials, even those who who agreed, at least to a certain extent with their aims. They felt that these demonstrations embarrassed the nation around the world, made it hard for the United States to achieve its foreign policy goals, you know, undermined the expectations of American democracy. And in, in from the point of view of, of, the, of the activists, of course, the there's a sense that you don't get anything done by simply playing by the, the established standards. You, you have to move outside those standards. You have to attack in a variety of different places. You have to, you know, gum up the gears essentially. But also, they were in. They were very aware of this Cold War context. They were very aware of the concerns of people around the globe, particularly aware of independence movements, anti-colonial movements across Africa, across Latin America, across Asia. They saw what they were doing here in the United States, not just as a, a civil rights movement domestically, but as part of an international struggle against repression and international struggle against imperialism, the rise of people of color around the world. They wanted to make alliances you know, across the ocean. For the US government, that's a very dangerous possibility. But the concern of government officials in, in Africa, particularly after the Birmingham protests, is a big part of why John F. Kennedy finally steps forward and sends his proposed ideas about the civil rights bill to Congress. So there's this convergence that, you know, the Cold War goals, the Cold War needs, and the civil rights goals and civil rights needs, they, they are opposing in very many ways, but at the same time, they also kind of fit together at, in, in places that propel events forward. And so to bring it back to Gettysburg very, very briefly, there's enormous concern on the part of many of the the, the centennial planners in July of 1963, that there are going to be mass demonstrations on the third day's field on, on July 3rd. Because again, remember, this is July of 1963. This is a summer of protests around the country and protests not far from, from Gettysburg. Um, and there's in widespread concern that protests will take place at the height of the centennial, you know, the height of this moment where all of the news cameras are focused out at the angle, the Gettysburg will be exposed sort of as another American community grappling with segregation, but also 
that it will be a spot for that will draw demonstrators from around the country because of its symbolic power. Now that doesn't actually happen, but the but the concern that it would drove some 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 significant small scale changes for people of color living in this community during that summer. And and to me, it's it's kind of fascinating if you sort of look at um, the interaction between America's ideals and how it appealed to uh, African Americans to you know live up to those with World War One, come and join the fight, help us win the war, and you come back and you have full citizenship, and they do, and then they come back and they don't get that full citizenship, and the same thing happens in World War Two, and they're a little more skeptical, but eventually, and now here again, there's this appeal like you know, get on board with these international policies and help us put a good face forward. And there's certainly a lot deeper skepticism and, and vocal opposition to that by the time the civil rights movement opens up. Absolutely. So, you know, certainly that, you know, the convergence of those forces during the centennial then become, uh, um, you know, just a really interesting dynamic. Do you think that um, the centennial planners and, and Gettysburg in particular, did they successfully navigate that moment in your opinion? I think that what's so interesting is that Gettys the, the Gettysburg Centennial shows us the extent to which planners can be in control of events and the extent to which they can't. Um, they they the plant planners did walk a very fine they they managed to walk that tightrope pretty effectively in their official programming, um, both during the battle anniversary and during the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, which was more cerebral, more focused on these international dynamics, more focused on the, the, the meaning of the Gettysburg Address around the world in, in a Cold War context. It was, it, was, um, it was less commercial, it was less uh, entertaining, but, but, Everything the planners did was existed in the context of a commemoration in which other people had roles as well, and other people had platforms to amplify their own voices. You know, certainly political leaders were were extremely engaged in all sorts of commemorative official commemorative events, in rededicating monuments, in dedicating new monuments, those, those dedications, those speeches, those processes were extraordinary politicized, extraordinarily politicized and, and very complicated. They also, um, you know, attendees, not just political leaders, attendees shaped their own experiences, you know, of the commemoration by what events they went to, which speakers they listened to, whose points of view they gave credence to, and the way that they experienced the commemoration outside of those official things. You know, to did they wander through the camps of reenactors? Did they go to the art exhibits? Did they walk on the battlefield at night? Did they go to the the fireworks and all sorts of things? You know, and, and how did they make sense of it? So you know, you had. Everybody from George Wallace to um, government officials encouraging people to see the um, the passage of the Civil Rights Act as the fulfillment of of Lincoln's new birth of freedom. You had ev you know, and everything in between. You had people championing this is the meaning of Gettysburg. If we understand the meaning of Gettysburg we will do this. And that would be everything from attacking housing discrimination and um, passing the Civil Rights Act to seeing this, to, to seeing civil rights causes as um, communist inspired and federal attempts to enforce any kind of civil rights law as a sign that the federal government had turned, was pursuing Soviet style communism. Um, and, and, and the planners, didn't want either of those extremes, but they couldn't control the 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 conversation fully. And it, it strikes me just as we talked about earlier that tension between preservation and commercial interests, and the, you know, like we see some of these same dynamics at work again today as well. I mean, there, there's so much about today on a lot of different levels that appear in your book that I think gives us a lot we can reflect on and, and take away. Um, 
So let me ask you, you mentioned all these different uh, figures who were involved in various ways. I got to ask you about Eisenhower, who is certainly, you know, one of Gettysburg's most famous residents. Um, uh, how do you see Eisenhower through this period? So Eisenhower was not terribly involved in the centennial. He was the he was the honorary chairman of the Pennsylvania Gettysburg Centennial Commission, which was the group, the state level group that that planned the activities. But in that role, he only spoke um, formally at the November commemoration. He presided over the November 19th, 1963 rededication of the cemetery. During the battle anniversary, he was actually out of town. He, he spoke at the Fireman's Carnival. I think it was like June 29th or June 30th, right before the, the, right before the commemoration. And I think... Eisenhower's Eisenhower's thinking about the the Civil War and its relationship to the present, I think, was generally more complex than was obvious in his public in these two public addresses, um, particularly the one in that he gave at the end of June. It said absolutely nothing about civil rights. It said really not a great deal about the Cold War. It was largely about um, the importance of of self-reliance and individual effort and not depending on government. And for many liberals, African-Americans, people on the more progressive side of the spectrum, Eisenhower was missing the entire point. His, His speech in November was somewhat on one level i would say it was it was somewhat more nuanced but perhaps it was all, perhaps that just means it was more ambiguous so there was more opportunity for people to read whatever they wanted to into it mm-hmm. but i think that eisenhower's general engagement with the civil war and love of this landscape was much deeper and more complicated than for whatever reason really came through in his public involvement with the commemorations yeah, because you know he looms so large as as a resident of the town. He uses the battlefield for right. you know, and it's just because he does right. have that complex relationship. Now, of course, JFK is also invited to the uh, dedication or rededication of the National Cemetery. And instead, fulfills a commitment to go to Texas that leads to a national tragedy. Um, have you thought about that moment at all by chance? I have. I have. Um, so Kennedy was invited to give a major address on July 4th. He declined. He's then invited to give a major address on the 19th, on November 19th. He declines again. Um, I think this is probably not surprising given his hesitancy to be involved in other Civil War commemorative efforts, in, including ones taking place in D.C. There was a major commemoration of the Emancipation Proclamation that took place at the Lincoln Memorial. It was it was a program sponsored by the, the U.S. Civil War Centennial Commission and the Lincoln Group of Washington that involved a ton of high-level government officials, and it was explicitly Cold War focused. It was all about using that anniversary to send a message of the United States as a liberator on an international scale to the point that at at one point they had absolutely no African-Americans in any kind of speaking role, except Mahalia Jackson could sing, but, but every other speaker, every other, they were all like international diplomats. They're, they're, the, the, the legacy of the emancipation proclamation as framed by this event seemingly had nothing to do with African Americans in the United States. It was all about um, American diplomacy abroad. And Eisenhower, was, uh, not Eisenhower, Kennedy was expected to speak at that. And then sort of at the last minute, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to Europe. Here's a, you know, here's a, here's a, a, a recorded address. It was pretty clear that he saw the Civil War as too much of a political football. It's too much of a political liability. He did not want to engage deeply with it in a public way. He did visit Gettysburg during the centennial, took a a private tour of the battlefield. But yes, he's invited again in November. Um, He does not come. After his assassination, there's a lot of um, writing back and forth between people involved in the planning saying 
if he had just come, we could have, you know, we could have saved his life if, if he had just come here. But I think it, again, it shows the extent to which nobody could fully control this narrative. And it was so charged and so politically uh, volatile that Kennedy preferred to, to simply stay away, despite the fact that, you know, Woodrow Wilson had spoken here on the 50th anniversary. Um, <clears throat> Roosevelt had spoken on the 75th, but, you know, Kennedy really did not want to touch it with a 10-foot pole, although Lyndon Johnson does come to Gettysburg in 1963 at Memorial Day and gives a, a fascinating speech in the National Cemetery, which is all about civil rights and is really a direct response to Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which had just uh, been released earlier that month. So, and I don't want you to give away the store, but what do you think the legacy of the 63 commemoration is heading, uh, heading into the future from that point? I think it it had a lot of impact. I think that it it shaped the battlefield landscape as we know it today in the 21st century, both from a preservation standpoint and from an education standpoint. It 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 also opened the door to a, a new wave, a significant new wave of Confederate commemoration. The West Confederate Avenue, as we know it today, is despite the fact that you know, the Virginia Memorial and the North Carolina Monument and a couple of the others predate the centennial, by and large, that landscape as a whole is a product of this era. I think that this, this uh, the, the centennial in Gettysburg also kind of prefigures a little bit of the, the emergence, re-emergence would be a better word, the re-emergence of the emancipationist narrative of the war in some circles and, and contexts where it had not been strongly represented for a while. Certainly that narrative never died out, but it was not a narrative that most Americans encountered on Civil War battlefields or in in for quite some time um, prior to the centennial. At Gettysburg, we start to see that narrative slowly reemerge, but it is dueling with the increased physical and tangible presence of the lost cause narrative along um, along Seminary Ridge. I also think this, that, that the centennial is a, <clears throat> it, it, it prefigures some shifts toward living history and interpretive programming that is more focused on historical figures as people a human interest angle, an interest in the experiences and ideas of the non-elites, not the all the always the generals and the and the and and the um the officers, but the the, the emergence of more interest in the, the common, the common soldier, the common mm -hmm. civilian, the, the 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 person hiding in their basement, you know, it in Gettysburg. So I think it is it it there are so many different threads that you can trace out from the centennial um and they don't all align at all many of them are are contradictory but i think that is in part what is so interesting about it yeah, well, the book is gettysburg 1963 and it, I promise you, it will help you see the most famous small town in America with new eyes. Um, I love the book. I really appreciate it, Joe. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. So thanks so much for being with us here on the Emerging Civil War podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.